So after four videos and 26 pages worth of commentary, we've arrived at our final destination. Let me take one more chance to thank you all for the years of support, the views, the likes, the conversations in the comments and social media, and especially to you patron donors who keep me from starving to death. I'd have had to eat my game consoles by now, which would be a shame. I don't care much to live without these next 10 hits. So let's plug in and power on one last time. Well, for this list, I mean. After this, we'll be going back to regular countdowns. But first, I am the Green Scorpion, and these are my top 10 favorite video games of all time. My friends, it has been said that I like Metroidvanias. My friends, I like Metroidvanias. No, friends, I love Metroidvanias. I love the challenge, I love the exploration, the combat, secrets, I love tricky platforming and epic boss battles. Metroidvanias set in castles, in space stations, in underground tunnels, in ruined kingdoms, floating islands, mystical forests, mirrors, and in a subtropical paradise. So we finally hit the top 10 and we're starting with Shantae? Yeah, that feels right. I'm a huge fan of Metroidvanias, obviously. I try to play as many as I can, but there's something different about the Shantae series, mainly because Metroidvanias aren't usually so character driven. I mean, sometimes there are NPCs to get lore dumps and items from, but an ongoing series with the same main cast? That's something you don't normally see in this genre, but it gives a lot of incentive every time I return to Sequinland. After two small but respectable entries, WayForward hit the ball out of the park with Shantae and the Pirate's Curse, once they finally had the technology and the budget to make the world brim with life. No hate on the latest game. Half Genie Hero does a lot right, but Pirate's Curse makes some smarter design choices that gel better with the kind of game it wants to be. For instance, Shantae at this point has lost her powers and therefore can't access her trademark animal transformations. I do like these powers for Shantae, they're a part of what makes her special, but they also tend to bog down the pace, constantly stopping to dance and transform. Half Genie Hero brings the animals back with a much smoother system, but I think Pirate's Curse had the better alternative. This time, the depowered Shantae has to grudgingly join up with her arch nemesis Risky Boots, and over time she recovers Risky's pirate weapons and puts them to good use, both in fighting and navigation. These new moves are so sleek, you can easily chain from one to the other, and I love it when a Metroidvania can make me feel faster and more agile over time. Pirate's Curse also hangs together a bit better than Half Genie, if I'm splitting hairs. There's a few subplots, but it all revolves around Shantae and Risky versus the Pirate King, and every side quest pays off narratively in some way. And I love how many side characters we've accumulated over the course of the series. Squid Baron, Ammo Baron, Techno Baron, it kinda reminds me of Adventure Time with how many people just have Princess or Wizard in their name. You really can't go wrong with either game, and I love the visuals and extra modes of Half Genie, but Pirate's Curse just plays so well, I just want to speedrun it over and over again. And man, these character portraits look good in HD! Pirate's Curse remains the apex of the series, for now, but I have a pretty good feeling that might change real soon. Shantae 5 is on the horizon, and I can't wait to see what's in store. But whatever it is, I'm always ready to go. Speaking of Metroidvania, favorite Metroid game. When I first started this list, I thought maybe Metroid Fusion. It's probably the most nostalgic for me. But I decided to be thorough, consider all the games in the series, and when all is said and done, Metroid Prime's pretty damn great, isn't it? And it had no right to be! A beloved side-scroller series goes into hiding for 10 years, then resurfaces with a new studio as a first-person shooter? The most overblown genre at the time, I might add. Yeah, this never ends well. Except, it did. Retro Studios knew what they were doing and perfectly translated the eerie, isolated exploration of Super Metroid into what Miyamoto dubs a first-person adventure. Fun fact, 
In development, Retro Studios told Nintendo that they were having trouble making the player feel like Samus, since you don't see her on screen anymore. Miyamoto, in a moment of brilliant insanity, suggested, What if Samus had a bug head? Wouldn't that be cool? Cryptic at first, but this eventually became the visor. Alien guts splatter onto it, hot air steams it up, and under the right lighting conditions, you can even see a reflection of Samus' eyes. Great attention to detail there. And that's just inside the helmet. For a console already a little graphically challenged in its time, the scenery of Talon 6 still holds up, as does the gameplay. It doesn't control quite how you'd expect for a first-person shooter, but once you get the hang of it, the generous lock-on feature and Samus' excellent mobility make the game more about positioning than aiming your reticle. You know, like 2D Metroids. Just now, it's 3D. A state-of-the-art 3D map system keeps you from getting too lost, but Retro also understood that sometimes, the players need to get a little lost. That's how you find the best stuff. Between the revamped power suit upgrades, multiple cannons and visors, missile-guzzling super weapons, tons of energy tanks, and a really fun-to-use morph ball mode, Samus' slow build to phase on powerhouse feels amazing. And the bosses actually challenge you enough to make you want those upgrades without being too cheap. Best Ridley fight ever! I don't even mind the Chozo artifact hunt towards the end. It was a good excuse to comb the world some more, and by this point, I knew Talon 6 like it was my backyard. If you don't like backtracking in Metroidvania games, I don't know what to tell you. Personally, I'll take any excuse to go to Fandrana Drifts to hear that sweet music again. Prime 2 and 3 are great in their own ways, and I'm stoked to see what Prime 4 has in store. But with the coolest weapons, bosses, and atmosphere, there is a reason why this Metroid is Prime. Have you ever played a game, and felt like it was made for you? Like, sure, other people can enjoy it, but its qualities are so specifically tailored to your interests that the developers may as well have been inspired by your Google search history. Because that's how I feel about Wacamelee. I first heard of this indie darling from Comic Foil who told me it was the oscar game he has ever played. He's not wrong. A sprawling Metroidvania with combat reminiscent of beat-em-ups in fighting games, rewarding chain combos with flashing multipliers and fanfares, all in a pop art style and a world of Latin American culture. You got luchadores, you got Dia de los Muertos, even past the obvious stuff, the game's full of deep-cut references to real-world war. Heck, your Chozo mentor stand-in is Y Chivo, a Mayan half-goat beast, and he's hilarious! Even the things I don't like about this game feel like they were marketed towards me. Like, there's an emphasis on color-coded attacks, with enemies having colored shields that you need to break in specific ways, mended by directional flashes. Like, seriously, did they know I was colorblind? I feel attacked. Not only for combat, you'll also use the rooster uppercut and the dashing derp derp in complex- <laughs> WHY DOES THAT MAKE ME LAUGH STILL?! You'll be using these moves in complex platforming gauntlets. So not only is the perfect 50 hit combo based on precise input, so is your ability to traverse some deadly chasms. The humor is just my style, two parts smart genre subversion, one part background memes, which are made all the funnier by being in Spanish. I feel like I'm watching a grown up version of Mucha Lucha. And for the 10 of you who just got really excited when I said that, buy this game, right now. For that matter, this game has a sequel that might just be better than the original and I'm dying to play it. The only reason I haven't yet is because I've been so busy with videos. I did a full let's play of the first game which I was already familiar with, but I'd really like to share my first impressions of the sequel with all of you. If it's anything like the first, you're going to hear one happy Oscarito. As I explained before, I couldn't narrow it down to just one Mario game. Between the karting, the sports, and the RPGs, this plumber wears a lot of hats. It doesn't feel accurate to call them all just one franchise. But at the center of this pipe maze, Mario has always been about the core platforming experiences, which for the most part only get better with each installment. Mario 3 and Mario World? Unbeatable classics. 64? A trailblazing 3D adventure. Sunshine? Weird, but wonderful. I didn't think they'd ever top Mario Galaxy in terms of scope, beauty, and creativity. 
Because where do you go once your hero's been to space? Well, you go back to Earth, but you do it better. If Breath of the Wild was a full, free-roaming Zelda, Super Mario Odyssey is the closest I can imagine to an open-world Mario game that still actually works. Each level is a sandbox, at times literally, full of dozens of power moons to collect. Complete a story mission? Get a moon. Beat a boss? Get a moon. Some random shape that looks important? Yeah, that's probably a moon. I know some purists don't like this, it does kind of devalue the main collectible, but personally, this never really bothered me. Like, remember those freaking blue coins in Sunshine? They were annoying because they felt stashed away where people would never think to look. At least each moon is tied to a challenge, however small, that's much more rewarding than happening upon a crappy secondary collectible. For Odyssey, I combed every nook and cranny, and there's enough gameplay diversity to justify so many objectives. Mario's movement is more versatile than ever, with a new roll ability helping him cross the expansive worlds, and a jump-bounce-dive combo that you'd think would break the game. You'd think. But every time I got somewhere I thought was out of bounds, I'd find a pile of coins or something. You cheeky dick waffles! you knew I'd try to get up here! By this virtue, Nintendo's perfectly content knowing that the expert platformers can skip huge portions of their levels. In fact, they reward it! Any designer can put in different difficulty levels, but Nintendo did the harder thing, making levels that newer players can easily overcome with enough effort, but veterans can feel great breezing through. And as if Mario wasn't tricked out enough, he can now possess a myriad of other creatures for even more unique level design. Goombas, Bullet Bills, Cheap Cheeps, and a bunch of weird new faces. I love Uproot and his stretchy legs, it turns the game's mechanics on its head. You can beat this game with less than 20% of the total moons, and to some people that's a disappointment. To me, it's a challenge, mainly for that 100%. It's not for everyone, but Odyssey is for those with a certain Miyamoto in philosophy. If the game is fun, playing it is its own reward. Which I think is felt in every weird facet of this weird game. Every Mario game has been a celebration of the franchise to some degree, sneaking in callbacks and remix jingles. But we knew Odyssey was different ever since that one trailer. Yeah, you know the one. I'm talking about Jump Up Superstar. That catchy, shamelessly on-the-nose big band bash. The thing is, it's not just a song from Pauline to Mario that summarizes the entire game. Though, it's that too. But to borrow an analysis from YouTuber NitroRad, this song is like a love letter from the game to you, celebrating all the good times you've had with the franchise before, while mixing in crazy new elements as a promise that, hey, Mario's not going anywhere anytime soon. We're not out of ideas. Ruined castles, soup worlds, a metropolitan city of weird realistic humans, it doesn't matter where we go. As long as there's gaps to jump and coins to grab, Mario is still number one. Super Smash Brothers. I actually had the Wii U edition as a placeholder here for months, but I knew that in December of 2018, that space would be usurped. Each console Smash game has surpassed the last as far as I'm concerned, and Super Smash Brothers Ultimate did not disappoint. Every character, every single character makes a grand return. Wouldn't three versions of Link feel redundant? Screw it, throw them all in there! Also, let's bring back Pichu, and make him awesome! Not only does the roster put most fighting games to shame, it's impeccably well-balanced. Sure, the tournament scene has its favorites, and Bowser Jr. is not one of them, but that stuff really only matters to the highest level of play. You can pick up anyone from Zippy Zero Suit to fatsos like DDD, and if you're good enough, you'll get results! And okay, World of Light isn't the most robust one-player mode we've ever had, frankly, it's pretty repetitive, but as far as the base game goes, Smash has never been better. So that's why Ultimate is the best Smash Brothers. But why Smash Brothers in the first place? I love traditional fighting games, but Smash is anything but traditional. 
The intricate quarter circle inputs are replaced with more down to earth button combinations. So even playing Lucas for the first time, you'll at least know how to execute all of his moves, even if you don't know how to best do it yet. Or if you really miss those quarter circles, pick Ryu and Ken and you'll feel right at home. Smash is a lot friendlier to newcomers. Once you adapt to the utter chaos of it, you'll at least understand how to connect attacks. But if you put in the time, incorporate more techs and parries, this game is a blast competitively. The fact that you don't have a health bar, but rather a damage gauge that gets you knocked back further the more punishment you're dealt, it means those true combos require a little more strategy than just falling back on the same input string you always use. What might be a perfect flurry at lower percentages may leave an opening if the enemy is at high damage, and factoring in characters' various weights and movement options, you'll need to adjust your strategy to the situation. It's as much a platformer as a fighting game, and half the battle is in positioning and approach, often culminating in a frantic dance around the arena's edge while one player tries to recover. On the other hand, even when you're getting trounced by your opponent, the ring out system means it's never too late to turn things around. One good spike, and suddenly it's all tied up again. Ultimate is the latest in the line to improve things for all types of players. All stages now have Omega and Battlefield forms for no frills rumbles, or turn up the items and have yourself an 8 player catastrophe. The best player won't always win, but you'll have some great stories to tell. The last reason, though maybe not the best, is the metric crap ton of fan service. I love Nintendo so much, so seeing so many stages, assist trophies, song choices, spirit battles with funny in-joke stipulations, I'm in fanboy heaven. Not to mention some third-party games getting way more love from Smash than from their own developers. Look how many Castlevania remixes we got! And the attention to detail! Sonic drowns faster than any other character. There's an assist trophy of Guile that just crouches in Sonic booms the way cheap Street Fighter players do. The Pokemon trainers wear a Versus Seeker. And have you looked in the background of Great Bay? That's its exact layout from Majora's Mask. These loving tributes only make me more invested in the game's solid mechanics, and I've been trying my hardest to improve my skills. If I could go pro with any one game, this is the game I'd want it to be. I'm a long way off, but I see myself playing this game for a long time. Especially because Nintendo seems to be pushing the envelope further and further in regards to who can be accepted as a Smash Fighter. Since its release, we've had Joker from Persona 5, the hero from Dragon Quest, and Banjo-Kazooie! And here I am recording this, still wondering who those last two fighters are going to be. Only time will tell. It warms my heart to see beloved franchises continue to improve upon themselves over the years, or for indie developers to make their own more elegant versions of older games. But these last five entries are more old school. As for number five, well, in 25 years, I don't think we've ever improved upon Chrono Trigger. We have other RPGs now with more content, better graphics, more complexity, and depth, but Chrono Trigger for what it is, strikes perfection. No frills, no fluff, just the good stuff. Chrono Trigger boots up with this beautiful pendulum intro that still gives me chills. You get to the Millennial Fair with all of its optional features, follow your blind date through a portal to the Dark Ages, save a princess with the help of a chivalrous frog knight, and this is all just the first two hours. Then you're in a distant future and learn that your planet is doomed for destruction by Lavos, one of the most intimidating monsters in RPG legend, and the rest is history. Pre-history, post-history, all kinds of history. Because it's a time travel story, and one that, to its massive credit, almost makes sense. Enough sense to tell a great story without getting bogged down by boring quantum details at least. The battle system finds balance in simplicity. You get three characters, they can attack, use items, or tech. That's it. Not that I don't like the more advanced RPGs, but even with its limited toolset, Chrono Trigger creates memorable and dynamic combat. There are no random encounters either, and most of the enemy groups have interesting gimmicks. They move around the battlefield, so you'll have to use techs that take advantage of certain geometry, employ different strategies, and targeting orders. For good measure, you and your team have their own double and triple techs, moves that combine the powers of characters for amazing results. Almost any combination will have at least one triple tech, so I find myself constantly swapping my party around, which is fine because I love all of these guys. 
And did you know that this game is only 15 hours long? Feels longer, doesn't it? Well, that's because Chrono Trigger is so efficient in its world building that it can establish five different time periods and guide you through them out of order without any pointless diversions. There are side quests that might tack another two hours on, you have a lovable party member from each one, something that its sequel, Chrono Cross, didn't quite get. Each member, with great character design by Dragon Ball creator Akira Toriyama, takes a personal journey that ties into the main plot. You don't have to level grind unless you want to. Enemy encounters are paced to give you just enough experience, and even if some bosses are really tough, the savvy strategists can best them just by changing up their strategy. Or, if you want, just grind levels and brute force your way past. You do you. And again, I've played longer RPGs that I just love. One of them is still coming up. But what they do in 40 hours, Chrono Trigger accomplishes in half that time. Which leaves plenty of time for, and it invented this term, New Game Plus. This is a story about time travel after all. And as the court scene in the beginning of the game expresses, your actions have consequences across the entire universe. There are a dozen extra endings that you can collect after your first playthrough. Now, I've complained about this kind of split storytelling in other games, like the Jude Mila split in Tales of Zillia, or the Ephraim Erika campaigns in Sacred Stones. But again, those are 40 plus hour games. I'll replay them eventually, but after beating one route, I'm not quite ready to just hop back in for another half of my story. Chrono Trigger's main path stands on its own, but with its bite-sized length and the enhancements of New Game Plus, it's actually viable to run back through and see what other endings the game has to offer. And some of them get nuts! If you're lucky, you can track down a coveted DS or PS1 copy of the game with a few extra enhancements, but there wasn't much they could do to add to this package. It's an absolute treasure. I stand by my philosophy that there is no perfect video game out there. But Chrono Trigger is the one title in the entirety of video game history that I feel came the closest. Perfect doesn't mean favorite, however. And the Super Nintendo hosted one other RPG that I like a little more. I certainly talk about it more. Final Fantasy VI. I mean, three if it's on the actual Super Nintendo. I personally didn't try it until the Game Boy Advance port that got the title right. And fixed a lot of the iffy translation. Either way, VI is my favorite Final Fantasy. I've actually heard a lot of backlash lately that this game is overpraised, and maybe it is. It seems to be the favorite of most countdown artists in my periphery. If you prefer 7 or 10 or whatever else, you have good reason to. I just prefer the more retro style fantasies. I remember thinking it was so cool how this game blended industrial technology with the swords and sorcery style, with an in-game explanation for why we have both. You know, before Final Fantasy became straight up science fiction. And this sprite work! I love how for the first time in the series, characters use the same sprites in battle as on the overworld. Not only did this save memory so they could make them more detailed and expressive, it also connects the story in and out of battle, and lets certain moments like Leo's last stand or these shenanigans with Gao play out more authentically. This way, we can actually introduce Realm's paint powers as both a story element and a gameplay mechanic simultaneously, for instance. To be less technical, Final Fantasy VI gives us the largest playable cast this side of Final Fantasy Tactics, and while you won't love every single one of them, they're all certainly unique in personality and abilities. Unlike later games that let you basically put any ability on any character, pre-7 games use the character's unique class and powers as part of their background. Setzer is the roguish gambler, Shadow is the edgy ninja, Edgar and Saban's polar opposite natures are strengthened by their focus on technology and martial arts respectively. But there's still plenty of room for customization. The Magicite system lets you teach spells to anyone you want, even if some characters have better stats for it, and there's a ton of different equipment options and relics to support any style of gameplay. After a certain point, you can just ignore half the characters if you want, though it's gonna make that last dungeon quite a predicament. The story, which like Chrono Trigger is a lot shorter than you remember it being, throws you for loop after loop, First splitting the party so you can get to know all of them as individuals, then bringing them together with these weird army defense segments, and just when it looks like you're at the final boss, the villain actually wins, and you've got another half of a game to get through. 
Here in 2019, we're pretty used to post-apocalyptic scenarios, but back then, how many times did you actually see the heroes fail to save the world? And you can't just leave it there. You gotta pick yourself back up, collect your broken brotherhood, and stick it back to that sadistic clown in the sky. I know we've reviewed it to death, you might think there's no reason to go back to it at all, but I still look at modern RPGs and say, wow, this aspect is kind of flat. Why couldn't they do what Final Fantasy VI did? What more can I say about Fire Emblem Blazing Sword that I haven't already? I've already done a full Let's Play, a 5 minute reflection, and just recently I explained my undying love for Lady Lindis. It's my favorite entry in one of my favorite franchises. It was my introduction into the series, same for most Americans. I was playing a lot of tactics games on my GBA at the time, so my childhood friend Steven lent it to me. Having only known Fire Emblem from Melee, I remember spending the first few hours thinking, So where's Marth? I hear his music, so where is he? Oh, there's Roy. Uh, no. Ellawood? Who are you people? I wouldn't know for another few years that this was actually the prequel to Roy's story, which we still haven't seen an official release here in America. But not knowing its prequel status, Blazing Sword worked perfectly fine for me as a standalone story. Some people aren't as big on Lin as I am. It's true, Lin's story is kind of tacked onto the front of this thing. No doubt as a tutorial for us dumb westerners getting into tactics games for the first time. But while she factors into the bigger narrative only slightly, I think it works great as an introduction, and made me really excited when Ellawood's group did go back to Lycia to pick up the Lindis League. That's not the only thing making Blazing Sword a great entry game for the franchise. You have just the right balance of difficulty. The game's never downright unfair on normal mode but it'll punish you if you don't learn the mechanics in and out. And yes, Awakening would later improve things drastically, like better feedback on support progress and an optional casual mode without permadeath, but I like permadeath so I wouldn't have turned it off anyway. What they haven't improved are these critical animations. The sprite work on these characters is a joy to behold, and I love how the colors just pop. Even when two units are identical, you can still tell who's who by the bold color choices. Each recruit has a surface charm, and there's more about them to unearth through support conversations. Nowadays I just look that stuff up, but learning different things about a character in every playthrough always kept me coming back. And unlike most other Fire Emblems, almost every single character is good. Some better than others, but even pre-promoted units like Marcus are perfectly suitable for the endgame. If you want to put in the work and level up Nino, you'll be rewarded. If you'd rather stick with Eric, that's fine too. Or if Eric died and you're short one Sage, Pence got your back. It's great slowly growing from a plucky band of five to a standing army of knights and clerics. Without too much plot dumping, I understood the layout and politics of the world I was in, who the bad guy was, and what he was doing. When the party goes somewhere, I get why they go there, and that it'll probably lead to a fun, nail-biting skirmish. And, as a set, Ellawood, Lynn, and Hector make for the strongest lords in the series, narratively at least. Pray for good growths on Lynn and Ellawood, Hector will be fine. It's also interesting that this is a prequel, because the story revolves so much around the idea of legacy. Ellawood is challenged with the possibility that his royal father might be involved in some shady dealings. Hector needs to confront that his older brother, the Marquess, isn't immortal. And Lynn just found out about a family history she never even knew about. On the other hand, here's Nurgle trying to bring back the good old days when dragons walked the earth, his ancient comrade Athos trying to stop him so that the new world can live, and Ninian and Nils caught in the middle as... well... Spoilers. And I don't think I realized all this when I was first falling in love with this game, but it was passively making the story better and better and making me love it more. It's like this game's archaic support system. You can't see these two units falling in love, but they are. Great mechanics, great strategy, great story, great look and feel. I've played it a dozen times already, and I'm pretty sure I'll play it at least two dozen more. I might even use Loan one of these days. You'd expect my top 3 or 4 games to come from my top 3 or 4 franchises, which makes number 2 a little strange because I don't like the Metal Gear series that much. I like it a great deal, but when I think of the franchise as a whole, there are maybe 2 games in there that I really love, 
The rest I mostly enjoy is an exercise in untangling continuity. But Snake Eater is different. I don't like it just as Metal Gear Solid 3. I like it almost the same way I like a movie. Just a playable movie. And I do mean playable, not the two minutes of stealth missions between cutscenes like Metal Gear Solid 4. By Metal Gear Solid 2, Hideo Kojima has already built a world of political intrigue with convoluted schemes baked into even more convoluted schemes. But before sending Old Snake to put this messed up chess game to bed, Kojima decided instead to take a step backwards, a prequel about Snake's daddy, the original Snake, on a mission to prevent a Russian psychopath from starting World War III. As complicated as the series is, the internal plot of Snake Eater is pretty easy to follow. There's a madman with a dangerous super tank. Destroy the super tank and stop the madman. There's more to it than that, of course, with power players like Eva, Ocelot, and the boss all hiding their own motivations. But like Blazing Sword, you can play through Snake Eater without the rest of the series without feeling lost. Not only is this version of Snake more lovable than ever, the connections he forges along the way are compelling, but not overwritten. And if you're familiar with the rest of the series, it gives you new insight into the greater narrative and more hype for the finale to come, Metal Gear Solid 4. This is the perfect prequel, recontextualizing the series and setting up for the future while still having a heart of its own. It's home to one of my favorite tragic boss fights in gaming after all. There's a reason I teared up when I first heard that Snake Eater remix in Smash Ultimate. With the story streamlined, it's easier to enjoy the robust tactical espionage available to you. Unlike the metal corridors of previous games, Snake Eater is largely outdoors, requiring survival skills and resource management. Snake's gotta eat, he's gotta address his injuries, and he's gotta keep himself camouflaged. This can really mess with the game's pace, and I have trouble defending that as a good decision, but for me, it left time to reflect on the plot and characters in between tense moments, and made for a pretty snazzy wilderness simulator. It's kind of like this super long ladder. This should be annoying, and to some, it might be. But there's so much atmosphere that Kojima somehow makes it work. As usual, Kojima peppers your playtime with surreal and memorable moments. Without needing appendances of backstory, the cool bosses can just be cool bosses, like the End's No Frills Sniper Gauntlet, or the Sorrow's River of Death that uses your kill count against you. You ever save and come back during the interrogation scene? Snake has this crazy dream sequence that plays like Devil May Cry. What the hell was that about? Well, either way, it was awesome. It's an odd emotional roller coaster only a true auteur could have made, and that wouldn't have worked nearly as well in a film or novel. You need to be the one who pulls that trigger on the final boss. If you've only watched playthroughs or heard about it, you don't understand how powerful this moment is. Weird, wonderful, and full of drama. You almost forget how silly the name is. I really do wish I had something more surprising to pull out at the end of all this. Because I am not at all unique for having The Legend of Zelda as my favorite franchise, and Ocarina of Time has topped so many all-time best lists. Maybe too many. I won't pretend that Ocarina of Time is a perfect game, or even the best Zelda game. But feelings are feelings, and my love for this game transcends all logic and numerical value. After so many years of praise, it's become trendy now to look at this game more critically. That's fair, there's as much to learn from this game's shortcomings as its strong points. But don't be mean about it, please. It's a lot like Undertale, really. Yes, it is rather overpraised, and some people ignore its flaws and put it on a pedestal. But something about it touched the hearts of thousands. Those feelings are real, it's not just nostalgia. Even if I went back and discovered it was worse than I remember, the original impact it left on me still has value. So, let's take a look. Ocarina of Time brought the high adventure and puzzling dungeons of the Zelda series elegantly into the third dimension. Jagged as they may be, the dozens of weird and wonderful characters you meet along the way, the time-honored locales, the strange bosses, they sucked me in on my first playthrough. I spent a few years living in Hyrule. Even when I wasn't playing it, I was at school sketching Link and Saria on a piece of paper, or trading secrets with my friends. I couldn't afford a player's guide and I haven't figured out the whole internet thing yet, so I had to work out these puzzles for myself. 
Some of the dungeons are really dark. There was an actual sense of fear the first time I faced the Lazalfos in Dodongo's cavern. Or walking into Kakariko's graveyard. Oh, hell no! I didn't want to touch anything. But it's the only way to continue the game, so proceed I did. I triumphed over the wretched dead hands. I solved the mystifying Lost Woods maze. I outwitted those Gerudo and even overcame a fear of drowning to get that note from Ruto. And I actually think that time travel is really well implemented, at least in the way it makes you feel. At the beginning of the game, you're told that all the Kokiri who leave the forest eventually die. Little did I realize, they weren't warning me about the beasts out in Hyrule Field. They were warning me about growing old. It turns out Link's a Hylian, not a forever young Kokiri. So his leaving for his adventure means he'd rather face the dangers of the world than stand by in secure ignorance. This setup pays off when Link travels seven years into the future. Suddenly, your childhood is gone. You're an adult, whatever that means, and the world you've come to know in the first 10 hours of gameplay is... Well... Worse. The bustling marketplace is now just silent slums full of re-deads. Lon Lon Ranch is under crappy new management. And when you go back home, no one recognizes you. Luckily, you can turn back time whenever you want, and while it's not utilized to the fullest, Link has to deal with some problems in the past just as much as in the future. It's kind of fitting, actually, that people accuse fans of just being nostalgic, because this game is kind of about nostalgia. But if the game taught me anything, it's that it's okay to go back. You have to address some new turmoil when you get older. There's no avoiding that, but it's okay to carry a bit of your childhood with you. Oh, and Z-targeting was a great idea, and Navi's not that bad. Come off it, guys. This would be a good place to end it, if it weren't for one more issue. Ocarina of Time actually isn't my only favorite game. Two years later, Nintendo rushed out and made Jora's Mask, which uses the same engine and many recycled assets and music, but does something completely different with them. Less dungeons, more to do on the way to those dungeons, tons more side quests, four transformation masks, and a whole lot of subtext we've been writing theories and creepypastas about ever since. The reuse of assets adds to the unsettling atmosphere of the game, being that all of these faces and characters are familiar, but uncanny. It's like a dark reflection of Ocarina of Time complete with time travel. Majora's Mask uses its scenario to show us true darkness. The world will perish in three days, and at any point you can look up and see the unfriendly reminder looming in the sky. NPCs all respond to this news in their own way, many in denial and trying to hold the town festival in spite of the obvious, others running, hiding, or just reflecting on the disappointment their lives turned out to be. You can turn back time whenever you want, but if you explore during the last six hours, there's some real sad humanity on display. Remember the Swordmaster cowering in his closet? Or how Crimea is totally giving her little sister alcohol to dull her senses? The postman who wants to run but can't forsake his duties? And the wedding! Oh god, the wedding! With Ocarina, I have a lot of memories of the countryside and how it changes in seven years. But with Majora's Mask, it's more about the people. It's certainly not about the dungeons, they kind of suck in this game. Besides the Stone Tower, of course. But helping out townsfolk and filling in the bomber's journal, that feels amazing. So, what do I do here? Do I pick the age-old classic on which modern Zelda was built on? Or do I pick the cult classic that's unlike anything before or since? Well, it's my list. I pick both. A tie for my favorite game ever. I always saw these two as sister games anyway, especially with how similar they look and sound. They're the flint and stone that sparked my love for the Zelda franchise. And without them, I don't know how much into video games I'd have become. I can't think of a game before them that made me feel the way I do. I saved Hyrule and Termina and thought, I know these people aren't real, but for some reason, I know this is important. Not only did they show me the emotional complexity video games were capable of, but like Link, I grew up with the lessons of these games. 
they go hand in hand. Ocarina of Time taught me to keep my past in my heart. And Majora's Mask taught me how to let it go. The world is ever changing after all. And like this franchise, we are all striving to be better. But whatever happens, I can't imagine a world where I don't love The Legend of Zelda. <laughs>